And joining us now on the line from San Diego, California, Jeffrey Kopstein. He is the director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Toronto. And as I welcome you to the program, Jeff, I know many of our viewers will be asking themselves, if he's a U of T guy, what's he doing out there in California? So remind us. Well, I'm on sabbatical this year, which is basically a research and study leave. I'm a visiting professor at the University of California at San Diego, and I'm writing a book on Eastern Europe. Terrific. And that's where we want to start, because we're, uh, we're reading more and more these days that the next casualties of the global economic crisis may not, in fact, be banks, but they may, in fact, be Eastern European countries. Who's on the list of the most vulnerable right now? The most vulnerable are Hungary, Latvia, Romania, and Ukraine. And the reason that they're so vulnerable is because they all owe an awful lot of money to West European banks. How'd they get into that position? So how did they get in the position? Yeah. Well, it was, it's actually kind of interesting. When the European Union enlarged in um, 2004, there was the feeling that over time, the properties in these countries would become much more expensive because all of a sudden you had an open property market and West Europeans could start buying properties. Based on that fact, West European banks started lending to East Europeans, funding their mortgages um, and, and also consumer credit. And they gave them an awful lot of money. Here's the trick. They lent them the money, but the money, the loans were denominated in euros, which is to say that they had to be paid back in euros. But as soon as the economy started turning downward, the currencies of these countries, which are not yet in euros, the currencies of these countries started heading south, which means that each month the East Europeans who had to pay their mortgages, their mortgage payments were going up and up and up. And you had, in, a sense, in essence, what amounted to a kind of a, a foreclosure crisis, not too dissimilar, which is happening in other countries, including the one I'm in right now. Indeed. Uh, well, let's follow up with this then. I, I guess the assumption is, or the hope is, among these Eastern European countries, that the richer Western European countries are going to come sort of riding over the hill and save the day. Is that in the cards? Yeah, well, I mean, initially, yes, they are getting some money from, from Western Europe. A couple weeks ago, Hungary went to, to the West Europeans and said, we need some serious money for the whole region. Our banks are heavily in debt, and they're going to default. The West Europeans said back, said back to them, well, two things. First of all, the other East European countries said, like Poland, Slovakia, uh, Slovenia said, look, speak for yourself, Hungary. We're not in such a bad situation. As a matter of fact, we don't like being called Eastern Europe anymore. That's for you backward countries. For, for us, we can make it without the extra money. At that point, the West Europeans said, well, we're going to give money to Eastern Europe. We're going to give it, and this was not an unsensible thing to say, we're going to give it on a case-by-case -case basis. That is, if Hungary needs some extra money, they've guaranteed Hungarian banks with, with uh, $20 billion. Uh, 20 billion euros, I should say. And they're going to do the same for Romania. And the IMF is stepping in with a big package f for, for Ukraine. And of course, Latvia, where they've had anti-government protests, and the government has fallen, in fact, they've also um, guaranteed their banks with more money. The trick is this. The West European banks are so in hoc, and especially, I should say, Austria. Austria is so in hoc in Eastern Europe. Right? that to the tune of 70% of their GDP. If the East Europeans default, Austria will default. Uh, not just Austrian banks, but Austria as a whole. And interestingly, that was the event um, in 1931, was the default of the uh, Viennese bank, the Credit Anstalt, in Eastern Europe, which caused a big economic downturn from 1929 to 31 to turn into the Great Depression, which lasted for the whole next decade. Well, you, you anticipated where I want to go, but I'm going to hold off on that a little bit, because I do want to talk about, sure. um, uh, I, I want to get you to weigh in on two priorities which appear to be at play right now. They're saving the euro, which of course has gone down in value a great deal, or rescuing these right. Eastern European countries. Which do you think is a higher priority in, for example, Brussels, the, where the head of the EU is? Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I can't, give you, I can't give you a straight answer to that because they're fighting about it right now. I think that the, the, I mean, if I had to choose between those two, I think they're going to go for saving, saving the euro. Because really, the euro is the signal achievement of the European Union, the creation of a, of a currency union throughout fifth, what, is, what is now 17 countries. Two more East European countries, I should say, have joined, Slovakia and Slovenia. And to let the euro go would have gigantic consequences. And that, of course, explains why the West Europeans don't want to throw too much money at the East Europeans.
Do you think Eastern Europe, excuse me, do you think European officials are regretting enlarging the European Union given what's transpired now? The easy answer to that is yes, and they won't actually ever tell you that. Um, but you have to, over, let's say, one or two glasses of wine, they will, they will, say, they will say two things. One is, we should have not let in all these countries at once. It's just too big to govern. We went from being 15 countries to 25 countries to 27 countries. That was too big. The other thing is that these countries are too poor. They're not ready. We had this huge achievement in Western Europe that we'd really attained after World War II by putting all of these what were increasingly wealthy countries together. Now, I'm not sure that they're so right in saying this because, you know, no one expected the Europe, everyone thought of the European Union as a sort of club of the rich, a, a huge trading club, a way of making sure that the French and the Germans never fought again. But really starting from the early 1980s, the European Union turned into something else. And what they figured out is that if they could hold open the prospect for getting into the European Union, they could take countries first, Greece, Spain, and Portugal, which were dictatorships, and say to them, look, if you guys are nice democracies, we'll let you into the European Union. And that worked so well that after communism fell in 1989, and you had all of these post-communist countries that everyone was worried of that they would be unstable, they said to them, they said, look, if you guys stop fighting with each other, and you don't hammer on your minorities too much, and you're nice, good democracies, and you don't get in wars, and one more thing, you pass our 80,000 pages of European Union regulations into your national <laughs> law, we're going to let you into the European Union. You've won the lottery of history. And this was a gigantic success, right? All of these countries were very stable. The Hungarians stopped speaking of their poor languishing brothers in Slovakia and Romania, or at least they stopped, they started talking about it in very muted tones. Um, the Czechs and the Slovaks didn't fight. The Romanians were nice to their Hungarians, or at least as nice as they can be. And so this was a kind of a huge success, uh, geopolitical success. What it's turned into, of course, is a big economic burden. A big economic burden, but would you say that it is now, um, does it have the potential to take back all of that progress that you just described? Yeah, of course, you know, it's, it, it, anything can happen in politics. Um, there is the potential, and this is starting to happen throughout Eastern Europe. You have um, um, what you might call populist right-wing parties, and they're really spread throughout the region. Now, of course, these exist in Western Europe too, but in Western Europe you have much more stable, long-term democratic institutions. Nobody thought that a place like, let's just use Hungary as a running example here. Hungary, which had never had a free and fair election in its history, in its history, before 1990. Nobody ever thought before e the day of EU enlargement that Hungary would be a stable democracy with, with huge economic growth. And that was really the story throughout the 1990s and until basically a year ago. Hungary was a giant success story. Now what you have in Hungary is a kind of blooming, um, let's call it right-wing extremist party. Right? It's one of them is it's called Jobbik. And um, Jobbik has um, a good chance of winning a seat in the upcoming EU parliamentary elections. They've already captured, um, um, they've already done very well in local elections within Hungary. They could do very well at the European level, which is really strange because they're a deeply anti-European and anti-foreigner party, but they just want to use this in order to get into power. And you have these kinds of parties spread throughout the region. And the big danger, of course, is that democratic institutions become unstable, which we know did happen before, before World War II. Well, in fact, it goes further with Hungary's prime minister because he used the expression a new iron curtain when talking about the current economic circumstances. What did you think when you heard right. that expression used? Well, you know, obviously, the, he, was, he was rolling out the heavy cannons there because the West Europeans don't want to be accused of a new Iron Curtain. I mean, the, the original Iron Curtain, of course, referred to, um, referred to communism and the complete closing off of Eastern Europe from Western Europe. And I, I don't think we're going to go that far. I don't even think we're, we're close. A lot of things would have to transpire before that happened again, including um, the collapse of democracy throughout the region and a kind of the potential for contagion into Western Europe. And we're not even close to that point. But what is true is that at the core of the European Union lies a kind of uh, an agreement. And the agreement is one of solidarity. And let me explain what I mean by that. Within Canada, 
we know that there are these transfer payments between provinces. And the idea is that we don't allow the, really the poorest of the poor provinces or the poorest areas of the poorest provinces to fall below a certain level. And they have the same idea within the European Union. And that could work pretty well as long as the poorest areas were not too much poorer than the richer, richest areas. But now, of course, you've brought in these very poor countries, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, countries that are not only poor but have state institutions that are corrupt. And the question is, will there be enough money in order to sustain minimal social services, unemployment insurance, schooling, public health, for Romania and Bulgaria, money which is being transferred from West European taxpayers, from the Dutch, from the Germans? Well, if there's not enough money, I gather some observers are seeing two potential breaking points or two potential cleavages in Europe's future. One is the old kind of east-west divide. The other is, a, I guess, a, a more updated, the haves versus the have-nots. Do you see it? Oh, do you see it one way or the other? Um, I don't think we're there yet in order to make a, a definitive decision. I think that, yes, if you would have gotten on a train let me just use an example. If you would have gotten on a train in the year 1900 in, say, Amsterdam, and you would have taken that train all the way through Europe, south and east, to Istanbul, you would have seen a gradually kind of neatly regressive geographical pattern of economic development. The farms would become poorer, um, the, the technology used would be worse, the streets would be worse, the buildings would be worse. If you would take that same train today, Everybody's at a higher level, but that same neatly regressive pattern of, of, of economic development, that still exists within Europe today. So the question is, is Europe, which we thought was going to be the case until about a year ago, was Europe going, is, is Europe going to have the capacity to take these poor countries, which, were st which are still new democracies, and raise them up to the level of the West? That has been called into question, and that was the bargain. That was what everybody in Eastern Europe was told was going to happen if they joined Western Europe. And now normal people, like you and me, who are paying mortgages, right? they're, they're saying, look, we've done everything we were told to do. We played by the rules of the game. And now look, look what's happening to us. We're getting the shaft. Do you think that there is a, a chunk of, um, I don't know, popular support or even government support in those Eastern European countries as they look further east for the kind of uh, Chinese authoritarian capitalism, which, you know, relatively speaking, has had great success out there. We're not there yet. Um, I keep on using that, but I think this is very important to keep in mind. If there was a really appealing, successful, remember, they still view themselves as Europeans. 1989, I mean, this was all, I mean, one point about this first. This is the 20th anniversary of the fall of communism. This was supposed to be a great celebration. It's the 10th anniversary since the enlargement of NATO, and it's the 5th anniversary since the enlargement of the European Union. And what this all tells us is the East Europeans always viewed this as a return to Europe, to European values, to European institutions. The focus would no longer be Moscow, or as you're implying, Beijing. The focus would be Paris. The focus would be Berlin. And if there was an appealing set of alternative institutions, alternative orders out there right, that European intellectuals could get excited about, that they could, let us use an extreme case, betray their countries for, in the way that Western European intellectuals betrayed their, their countries um, in the interwar period for, the, for communism and fascism. If there would be such a set of institutions out there, yes, all of a sudden you would f start to find pro-fascist um, or pro-communist or pro-Chinese, as you're implying, parties, people within Hungary, within Ukraine, within um, 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 Bulgaria and Latvia. These are the, that's what you should look for. We're not there yet because these countries, if you look at them, historically speaking, they're not system makers. They're really system takers. If you look at their histories, from the, in the 19th century, they adopted liberal democracy. Why? Because the rest of the world was liberal democratic. In the interwar period, they fell into authoritarianism because the rest of Europe was going towards right and left-wing authoritarianism. In the communist period, despite the fact that the, that the Soviets had kind of captured Eastern Europe, you had native communists within Eastern Europe, and they adopted communism. And of course, after 1989, they quickly ran to adopt European-style institutions and to give up their own sovereignty to Western Europe. 
So the question is, is there going to be a new system maker out there that native elites within these countries can say, you know what, we want to be like that. We want to give up the, the, um, the, the dream of a successful liberal democracy here within Eastern Europe in order to be like this other order. And that other order is not yet in the cards. Is it Russia? That's an interesting question. Um, it certainly hasn't been until now. I mean, Russia, Russia before 1991 was a communist country with a global universalist ideology that may have not been liked by a lot of people, but it had this kind of pretense that everywhere in the world was going to be communist and there was going to be this world of justice. What is Russia's ideology today? It's hard to really argue that Russia's got a global um, ideology of salvation today. They don't really have that. What they've got is a kind of a hardcore ideology of national interest. And it's hard to believe that that's very appealing to intellectuals, politicians, or masses on the ground within Eastern Europe. Um, what Russia is today is, it, it, well, at least it has been until very recently, is a country which has a lot more money. It's starting to throw its weight around a bit. Um, it's interesting, at my center in Toronto, until recently, we used to have Russians come there and say, could we'd like to start up exchanges with you? And we'd say, well, we don't have any money to give you. And they'd say, well, then we can't do it. A couple of years ago, the Russians started coming and said, we want to do an exchange with you. And they, we'd say, we don't have any money. And they'd say, we don't want your money. We have lots of money. And th these were all petrodollars. And so Russia had a lot of money. It was able to throw around its weight. It could use, of course, the energy weapon against Western Europe. And this is actually an interesting source of divide between East and West Europe. The Western Europeans, and increasingly interestingly the Obama administration, wants to make nice with Russia. Why? Because they view Russia as a country that can do things for them. What can they do? For the West Europeans, Russia can, support, can supply energy, lots of gas, lots of oil. For the Americans, Russia can perhaps supply an in into Afghanistan, once Kyrgyzstan has cut off the United States' access to Afghanistan, and perhaps they can have some power vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. For the East Europeans, they view Russia still today as a source of deep threat. And if you look at the recent NATO Council, when NATO agreed to start relations again with, uh, with Russia, the big objections came from Lithuania, came from the Baltic states, came from Poland, who are deeply afraid of much closer relations with Russia. Hmm. Jeff, I've got a minute left. Let me try this one last thing. You know, of course, throughout the course of uh, European history, there are these big isms that seem to follow very desperate times, communism, fascism, right. and so on. Do you see an ism out there on the horizon, given the desperate times they find themselves in today? The only ism that's really out there is a kind of, of it's, it, what I'll say, I don't really have a word for it. It's a, a combination, let's call it red and brown. It's a, it's a backlash against global multiculturalism, um, at, combined with the idiom of, of, let's call it, proletarian internationalism, state assistance for the economy, a rejection of, of markets. And you have that within Eastern Europe today. There is the small kernel of this kind of ideology. It's still a minority. It's there. It's, of course, much bigger the farther east you go. It's in Russia. It's in Ukraine. It's in Hungary. But it's, it's, we, it hasn't yet gelled into something we can say that these countries are all going to become unhitched, unmoored from Western Europe. But it is cause for alarm. It is cause for the West Europeans, the Canadians, and the Americans to look at this area of the world again and say, let's not take for granted what we've achieved over the last 20 years. Understood. Jeff, always good to have you on TVO. Thanks so much for joining us from San Diego tonight. Thanks for having me, Steve.